Turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 26. We have quoted some verses here often. And so this is not, or should not be, a surprise to any of us that these verses would be applying to things that are going on in the world right now. But let me read this. And everything I'm going to read today is going to be out of the Amplified Bible. Sometimes I read out of the New King James, but I'm going to stick with the Amplified today because I like the additional meanings that the Amplified gives us. Uh, Isaiah 26, verse 7 says, The way of the righteous is straight and it's level. You, O Lord, who are upright, direct aright and make level the paths of the just and the righteous. Well, you know, level ground is a whole lot easier to walk on uh, without falling than inclined ground. I've been last six months or so, I've been starting to do some of my running daily exercises on, on trails in some parks that have hills and <clears throat> there's rocks and dirt and all kinds of terrain to run over. And when I first started running on those kinds of surfaces, uh, it took some adjustment. I, I mean, yeah, I did stumble quite often. Uh, because getting your footing on difficult terrain is, is not as easy as just walking when it's level. I mean, even just coming in the door over there, there's a little bit of a slant down to the parking lot. So, you know, you, it's not much of one, but you do have to watch your step when it's not level. And this just says here, that uh, if we are righteous, which simply means if we're in the right relationship with God, if, if we are submitted to Him and, and we have asked Him to forgive our sins and we, we believe His Word, then He says He's going to make our way level, regardless of, of what's going on out there, that He will make it level so that we can walk through the circumstances. So that being righteous, being right with him is the key to that. And then in verse 8 he says, Yes, in the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Our heartfelt desire is for your name and for the remembrance of you. Yeah, this is what we are. That's why we are studying his word this morning is because we want to hear from him And we want our lives to be pleasing to him. Verse 9, he says, My soul yearns for you in the night. Yes, my spirit within me seeks you earnestly. For when your judgments are in the earth, will the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness? See, it's going to take some difficulties uh, for most people, at least here in America, to, uh, to realize that the way they've been living is not pleasing to God. And so this is really actually an encouragement here in verse 9 that's saying that, well, when these judgments happen, then people are going to start getting right with God. And that's good. Now, that doesn't mean God has caused all of these things to happen. I'm 99.99 sure that man has had something to do with this. Uh, As Steve talked about on his video last night, this is almost assuredly what is referred to in Revelations chapter 6, verse 8, as the green horse. And these are judgments. I mean, you would say, well, God allowed it. Okay, God allows a lot of stuff that he doesn't do and that he doesn't approve of. I mean, every murder, every rape, every robbery out there, if it happened, then he didn't prevent it. So does that mean that was from him? No, of course not. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So these judgments don't necessarily mean uh, God sent 
a, a lightning bolt from heaven. I mean, there are those, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is that. But see, there's something about righteousness, about being right with God. Go to Psalms 85. We want to talk about this a little bit here this morning. I'm not going to keep you here very long. But in Psalm 85, verse 10, there is an interesting statement here. It's very concise. And it's about God. It, it's telling us something about God's nature that we need to lay hold of, that we, we need to grasp and understand. It says, Mercy and loving kindness have met together with truth. I would say it this way. I would say it that it is always merciful to speak the truth, to believe the truth, to receive the truth. There's another place in Psalms where it says, well, let the righteous smite me. It, it's actually a kindness. Um, now, there's also, it says in Proverbs at one place, that there is a, a speaking that's like the piercing of a sword. So we're not just talking about whether somebody is stating the facts when we talk about truth. You know, one can state the facts, but if their intent is to, to insult or to, to harm you or to belittle you or something along those lines, then that's not, um, that's not really truth the way God does it. When God speaks the truth, it's, it's always a, a, an act of mercy on his part. See, so mercy and truth... Are, are related. Now, let's, let's look on the other side of that equation there. We got mercy and truth kind of being equated here, right? Well, you know, there is sometimes people refer to a, a white lie, okay? They say, well, you know, I want to be kind. So, so uh, you know, if, if somebody says, well, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> You know, I mean, okay, and you say, oh, no, it, it, it looks great, and, and you really don't believe that. Well, that would be a white lie, okay? Now, I, I'm, I'm not saying you should say, no, the dress doesn't make you look fat. You're fat anyway. <laughs> no, that's, that wouldn't be, that, wouldn't, that might be the truth, but it might not be kind, see? So, so that wouldn't be a truth you should speak, but nor should you lie just because you think that by telling somebody something that they want to hear, that that per se is merciful. No, mercy and truth uh, de de depend upon each other. Okay, and here's another uh, equation here. Uh, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now, uh, another translation of the Bible, I don't remember which one it is, explains that that kissing each other doesn't just mean it's a, it's a, a friendly greeting. Uh, it's referring to a, a, a marriage relationship, that they're intimate, that this is a husband and wife. You could say that righteousness and truth are married to each other, that you don't separate those, those two, righteousness and peace. For that matter, you don't separate the, the pair righteousness and peace from the pair mercy and truth. That, that all of those are aspects of God's character and they work together. So righteousness is married to peace. Well, let's talk about that just a little bit. Um, go to the Gospel of John. We know that Jesus had some very blessed things to tell us about peace. First of all, let's go to John chapter 14. In verse 27, John 14, verse 27, in the Amplified Bible, it reads this way. He says, 
Peace I leave with you. My own peace. Well, we know Jesus is righteous. I mean, he is the embodiment of righteousness, right? So he's righteous and he has peace. You look at the situations all through Jesus' ministry, the time that they were in a storm, right? On, on the lake, in a boat. You know, that's not a good place to be in a storm is in the middle of a lake on a boat, right? And, and they were there and the disciples were rowing hard and the boat was filling up with water and Jesus was taking a nap. And, and they woke, woke him up and said, Master, we're dying here. And, and he said, well, just command that storm to stop. And so he rebuked the storm and it stopped. And they said, wow, who is this guy that can even control storms? Well, you know, we have, we have done that. I'm not saying that every time it happens that we have always been 100% successful, but there's been plenty of times that um, storms have headed into uh, our world here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex that the saints of God have prayed, and it's uh, at least not been as bad as it would have been. I'm, I remember in 1999, there was a tornado that hit a church downtown, Calvary International Church, and uh, there were people in the building praying. There were some ladies up at the, the top floor of the thing praying, and the storm knocked all the walls down of their prayer tower, but they were not harmed. And the pastor was in the stairwell down a few... Uh, floors below that and the security guard was there with him and when the wall started falling the security guard laid on top of the pastor and neither one of them got hurt. So uh, you know, Jesus says he has peace and he says and I give it and bequeath it to you. Well bequeath has a particular meaning within the realm of, of inheritance. You know, if, if you uh, left money to your heirs, if you died and you, you gave them, uh, you know, your houses or your bank accounts or whatever, we say that is bequeathing it to them. Well, Jesus, as we know, he's about to get crucified and then he's going to rise from the dead and he's going to speak to his disciples for, you know, 40 more days and then he's going to heaven and not coming back until, you know, sometime here in our day. So his peace is something that he has bequeathed to the church for all of these 2,000 years. So his peace is ours to have now. He says, I'm bequeathing it to you. And he says, it's not as the world gives do I give to you. So do not let your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, if we let something that means we are the ones that are in control of it, right? Some people say, well, I just can't help it, I'm afraid. Well, that's not what the Word says. You can do something about it. You know, you can pray. You can trust God. Now, that doesn't mean you might not feel agitated, but just because you feel agitated doesn't mean that you will let that fear dominate and control you. I'm sure every first responder, every police fireman, every, every military person going into combat, anybody that ever has to face some kind of uh, life-threatening situation feels uh, the agitation of the moment. But that, they, that doesn't have to cause them to be afraid so that they will not perform what their function is supposed to be. And he says in the brackets of the Amplified, he says, stop allowing yourselves to be agitated or disturbed. Do not permit yourself to be fearful, intimidated, and cowardly and unsettled. Because in John chapter 16, Jesus tells us something else that can help us to keep ourselves calm in the midst of adversity. In John 16, 33, he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. Being in him, that's not just being in a church building. And that's not even just being, you know, having the Bible open and reading it. And that's not just being 
uh, on your knees in prayer. Not that any of those things are wrong. All of those things are good and they're beneficial. <clears throat> but if we're in him, that means our faith and trust is, is directed toward him and not toward anybody or anything else or even toward ourselves. If we're in him, we are, that is faith. That is simply what being in him is, is faith. And we talked about Wednesday night, you might, um, well, I don't have that on the, uh, on the internet. I'll have to get that on the internet. But Wednesday night, I talked about uh, Abraham and how he is an example of righteousness. And so it wasn't because everything Abraham did was, was right and holy, because some of what he did wasn't right and holy. No, he was called righteous because when God promised him something, he believed it. He said, well, I'm going to take that to the bank. Well, that's righteousness. So that's being in him. And it says, in the world, you will have tribulation, trials, distress, and frustration. Have y'all been having any of that lately? Well, then, you know, in this world, that's going to happen. And I will add to that, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And it really ain't going to get better till Jesus comes back. Now, let me say this about what I just said there. They may come across here in who knows how long, weeks, months, and say, oh, well, we've taken care of this spread of this virus. Everything is, is all back to normal, and, and, and it's going to be better than ever was. Well, don't be too quick to pick up on that. Because it does say in 1 Thessalonians that when all are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. So, you know, a, a false uh, all clear is probably going to precede something even worse than what we're going through now. I'm just telling you that so when and if that happens, you won't be deceived by it. Okay, but he says... Uh, the, the tribulation, the trials, the distress, and the frustrations will come. But be of good cheer. Well, how can I be of good cheer in the midst of this? Well, cheer yourself in what God says. That's really the, the only place you can get good cheer now. We're not talking about, you know, going to the bar and, and, and having whiskey or something. Okay? Take courage. Be confident, certain, and undaunted. For Jesus says, I have overcome the world. You know what? From, from the, when the, the first day of his life when he was born in that manger in Bethlehem and he took his first breath and, and went, Wah! he had overcome the world because he was God in the flesh. He was sent here to send a message to devil. Devil, you have ruled the world for too long and, and I am the the lawful heir and, and owner of it, and I'm taking it back from you. And he has given that to us. He has overcome. He has never been, um, even when he laid his life down and allowed himself to be arrested and allowed himself to be crucified and his blood shed, all of that was in obedience to God to perform what God had sent him to do. And he overcame. Everything he did overcame the world. So, if we're following him, then everything we do can be to overcome the world. You know, it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that we overcome. How? By the blood of Jesus, by what he did, by our faith in what he did, and by the word of our testimony. Now, that's one that's up to us. You know, what he did, it's done. You know, the, there's nothing the devil can do about that. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's done. But what you can do is you can choose to believe it and you can choose to speak it and to get in agreement with it and live your life that way or not. You know, God gives us that choice. But he says, I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm it to harm you, and I have conquered it for you. Well, let's apply that specifically to peace. Go to Colossians chapter 3.
Because, see, peace is really, the, the Amplified Bible frequently says, peace uh, is defined as the absence of fear, agitating passions, and moral conflicts. That's how fear is defined. So, what we need instead of fear is peace. Colossians chapter 5 tells us this. Excuse me, Colossians chapter 3, I'm sorry. There's not five chapters in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, let the peace which comes from Christ. See, we get it from him. Jesus said, I give you my peace. So we're talking about his peace. We're not talking about, oh, well, yeah, everything's just going to turn out, turn out fine because Donald Trump says so. Or because I, I lived through the, the big crisis in 1978 or whatever, so I know everything's going to be all right. No, you don't. The only way we know it's going to be all right is because God has said it. Let the peace which comes from Christ rule and act as an umpire. Well, when do you need an umpire? When there's a contest going on. Well, what is the contest we're talking about? Oh, well, it's, it, there's a lot of it, a lot of, lot of uh, contention going on here. But basically, it's between humanity and Satan. And it says that Jesus acts as the umpire. Let his peace act as umpire in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your mind. See, we may have questions. There may be, we might be under pressure about something. And I would say here in Romans 8, we've been under some financial pressure for a long time about how are we going to continue to operate. Well, what, what I have to do, what we have to do, is we have to go to the Lord with that. And what he tells you, one of the ways you're going to know whether it's him or not, besides, uh, you know, the scriptures say it, is, well, do you have a peace that that's correct? Or, or do you have some misgivings like, mm, I don't know if that's right. You know, the devil could quote the Bible. He quoted the Bible to Jesus when he was tempting him in the wilderness. And, and Jesus quoted the Bible, and the devil turned around and quoted the Bible. But I'm sure Jesus, besides the fact that he is the Word uh, made flesh, that, that Jesus picked up on that the devil was twisting the Word. And so the word, when it's twisted, you are not going to have a peace about that. You know, if, if uh, you know, the word says such and such, but the devil says, okay, but you know, that doesn't apply to you. You know, you're a Christian, so you can get away with it or something like that. You're, something in you should be saying, hmm, that doesn't sound right to me. If something doesn't add up there, well, that, then you don't have the peace. And so don't go with that. It says, that peaceful state to which you as members of Christ's own body were called to live in. He wants us to be in that place of peace. And be thankful. And let the word spoken by Christ have its home in your hearts and minds. Well, how do we do that? Well, it's like I said a minute ago, you can come to church and fellowship with other believers. And even if you don't come to church and you just talk on the phone or, or on email or however it is, God does intend for us to be connected to one another. He did not say that, well, you're an island unto yourselves. Uh, let the word uh, have its home in your hearts and dwell in you in all richness as you teach and admonish and train one another. Now, see, it's not just the job of the person standing up here at the rostrum to be the teacher and the admonisher. Y'all can, can share among yourselves what the Lord is showing you, and, and somebody's going to need the benefit of what God is showing you as well as what God shows me or any minister. As you teach and admonish and train one another in all insight and intelligence and wisdom, and it, it can be done through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's why we do this music thing here. This is not entertainment. And, and to the degree that any church or any Christian thinks that, that uh, praise and worship is entertainment, 
Uh, it's so much more than that. It's just if, if that's all it is, you're you're setting your sights way too low because the music that praises and worships God is supposed to teach and to admonish us and making melody to God with his grace in your hearts. And whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence upon his person. So like if, if you believe God has said, well, we'll go here and do that. Well, if the, the, uh, the TB says, oh, no, don't do that or you'll get infected. Well, if God's saying go do it, then, you know, obey God. Whatever it may be, but do it in dependence upon him. Do it in, in your obedience and submission to him and not just because you took a notion to do it and then say, okay, well, God bless this. <laughs> you know, too often... I, I, I don't know, this is probably a very trivial thing, but too often, uh, if I've been hungry, you know, and I want a snack, I just go open the bag of chips and some, I'm cramming two or three in my mouth. Oh, oh, by the way, God bless, bless what I've eaten already. <laughs> well, you know, the time for me to ask him for his blessing on that was before I started putting it in my mouth. Now, I'm not saying he wouldn't bless it. I guess he would. <clears throat> and certainly... If I put any more in my mouth after that, I ask his blessing on that. But you know what he might be telling me is, okay, you're asking my blessing. Uh, you've already had one handful of those. One more handful is enough. Don't have any more than that, <laughs> right? I mean, he might say that. I don't know. But see, that's an example of what I'm saying. We don't just do what we please and then ask God's blessing on it. If we're going to be in dependence upon his person, we should be asking for his guidance as well. Well, Father, I thank you for that guidance. And we need it. We need it badly right now. But I thank you, Father, that you said that you would give us that guidance by your Spirit, that he would reveal the truth to us, and that we do depend upon you. We submit ourselves to you. And, Father, I thank you if there's anybody hearing this on the Internet uh, or any other way that doesn't know you, that doesn't have a relationship with you, that if they will just realize that Jesus is God in the flesh and he died to pay for their sins and that if they would just uh, ask him to come into their life and, and ask for his help and grace to stop their sins and to live for him, then, then they can be his child. And so we just thank you, Father, for, for your salvation. We thank you for your leading and guidance in this time. And, and Father, I thank you that you have great and mighty things in store for your people and for planet earth and that even as we enter this very difficult time that we've entered into that you're still with us that you would never leave us and forsake or forsake us or relax your hold upon us assuredly not and we thank you and praise you for that in jesus name amen <laughs>